This is SciBite, episode 51, for June 19th, 2012. Hi, everyone. You're listening to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast. This episode was live on June 19th, and it comes out Wednesday morning on June 20th, 2012. My name is Chris, and joining us, like every week, is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. What do we have coming up in today's SciBite? Today, we're going to take a look at what robots teach us about language, help Hmm. find exoplanets, emergency stretchers, the Chinese space program, sugar-powered implants, space telescopes, the pitcher plant, Voyager 1, and as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky this week. I am very much looking forward to today's episode. The stories that you just rattled off there uh, are all stories, most of which I followed with a lot of interest this week, and then a couple extras that you slipped in that I didn't even see. I'm very excited. I'm looking forward to talking about those. Uh, the, yep. the Chinese space program in particular also, well, in fact, why even delay? Why don't we get into the news? What is our first news story today? Teaching robots to talk. In a t- uh, they're trying to figure out exactly how infants you know kind of create their language how they put together things in order to be able to talk Mm. so what they did is a group created the robot that they called dichi you know like three feet tall didn't know any words at the start of the study but was built with the ability to pronounce every syllable in the english language oh interesting and then the programming was built so that it could smash together any of those syllables that they wanted so what was going to happen is they had all these volunteers that came together, you know, and they had little blocks and they'd show like green tree, green tree. Yeah. Okay. You know, trying to teach, you know, the little robot and it eventually go like green. <laughs> so just like pop out the words that they were repeating. It they looks were like of, a child too. Why did they have to make yes. it look like a child? Well, that was sort of the point was to kind of imprint upon the people like this feeling. So they would treat it like that. Yeah, so they were treated like that. They were told, you know, treat it like a child. Treat it like you really would a child because it's the similarity. They wanted to repeat that. So they kind of see this is how kids do it. You want to treat them the same way. It even cocks its head to the side like it's trying to understand. Yes. And it was funny because they built it kind of gender neutral. But the majority of the volunteers uh, kind of connected with it as a male. It kind of looks like a boy in the face. Yeah, so they're like, it's a boy. So watching or listening to the video and watching it that's that's in the show notes, you know, you can see them, they're like holding a little block and there's like a blue star and a green tree and a red something. So they like turn it over and point it to the robot, you know, and sp- repeat back what it was saying. You know, just talking normally. And so what it was learning was the most often said words first. You know, sure, so... So, you know, it's, that's the way it repeats. But what happened, they noticed was, you know, one of the, the connective words, you know, at, with, of, those kind of words that little kids don't say right away. Yeah, those, so it started using those words sort of right away? No. Oh. It did the same thing that little kids do. No. No. Yeah, it, it's because you say blue and it's always the same thing. Right. You you say at or with or of, and there's all sorts of meanings to them. Why did you? That kind of thing. Why? Yeah. Why is a, Why is a very hard thing. Yeah. So it's, you know, objects that stay the same, you know, and words that are repeated most often, which is, you know, why a lot of kids say mama or daddy first, because those are the words that are repeated and have a very physical connection. Mm-hmm. Mm. You know, so house is house, blue is blue, and... You know, it was, you know, it was, you know, in the video, it was saying that, you know, it looks like a little kid that tilts its head. It actually had a little, like, light up face that would smile when it was, like, paying attention to the, te- you know, the person. And it, like, stopped so smiling creepy. and, bl- like, blink a lot when it was, like, 
going to lose attention and kind of ADD off into the. I wonder if this is. World. I wonder if this is me getting old, but honestly, it's starting to creep me out. I mean, the chat room's kind of jest, but they say maybe maybe it's unwise to be doing this. Uh, where do you? Yeah, boy, I I guess it sure would make them a heck, a heck of a lot more useful, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, with like in general, a lot of these, like if you look at them in a certain way, these various robots are kind of creepy. And there is a kind of a story that connected with this that I found that was um, a study or, you know, a, a paper written like 40 years ago and it was recently translated into English that was, you know, the appearance as a human and the familiarity with people and how comfortable they were with it. You know, and so it was, you know, the, the more similar, the more similar, the more comfortable they were with it. And then right at the end, there's a huge dip. Oh, sure. Well, yeah, because yeah, you see that that level you see that of in CG. realism, you see yeah, that level of realism that you're like, ew, gross, go away. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, and then sitting still and then motion. You know, because so you see something in motion and it creeps you out a lot more. It's, it is, I think it's some sort of instinctual level thing where the human brain recognizes something is trying to deceive me and something's yes. not right here. And I, it, it doesn't make, I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that. Yeah, that's one of the major theories is that it's kind of built into your brain. Dead body going to make me sick. Go away. Don't oh, interesting. that. Interesting. Yeah. So that that kind of a thing. It does have a dead look to it in a way. Yeah. So, um, and so you know, I've, I've always heard of Uncanny Valley in terms of CG, but thinking of it in yeah. terms of robots, this thing, when it cocked its head to the side a little bit, it kind of it kind of got creepy. In, in the story, it actually talked about like prosthetics even, you know, like mm. um, a prosthetic hand. You know, and it's it's tough to say, but some people are creeped out by that. And when it starts moving, people are more attentive to not real strange. You know, and you want to look beyond that. That's the whole point. But it's it's a fact that that's how it works for some people. Right. And so the, some of these robots like this, it gets to a certain point of realism and it creeps people out, partly because... Because of this type of thing, you get to a certain reality and you're like, eh. The other part is, of course, uh, a lot of people in our generation, Skynet. We always think, yeah, the robots are going to take us over. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're, or... Or, or or setting them up to at least bit by bit, <laughs> yeah. one one new one new frontier at a time. Yeah. So, but some of these are built with very specific purposes. This robot was built very specifically to help learn how languages learned, mm -hmm. and in order to make it more natural, you know, for the volunteers to be more natural talking to it and treating it one way, you have to make it look vaguely humanoid. Yeah. I mean, there are robots in uh, Japan, I believe, made for dentists, like training dentists. That's like a little laying back and it's a little head. And it will, if you put the instruments in the wrong way, it'll like turn its head to the side right, and right. off. That kind of thing. It's for training purposes or built for a specific way. Right. Now, there are really realistic, you know, computer programs online that you can, you know, chat with. And I've talked to somebody in the past who said they worked on them. And one of them creeped him out so bad because it was so realistic. He like, he had to stop the program. He had to like get rid of it, but he felt like he was killing someone doing it. Huh. So I, there are, there are lots of different ways that it's kind of creepy. I've also heard the Star Trek argument that uh, if you design them, our shape and uh, and roughly our general size, then it's easier for them to use the things that we use and use the workspaces yeah. and work with the tools that we work with because, uh, you know, they're already built for them. Yeah. Uh, again, in Japan, there are greeters. You know, they have robotic greeters that look, you know, vaguely human and, you know, have the humanoid skin to them. You know, and they're built to greet the people instead of, you know, a secretary or someone. I know that's not the correct word. Sitting there directing people. And they're more, people in general, more comfortable talking to some sort of humanoid looking thing. Uh, I mean, the, I mean, you're like you're saying, they're, it's easier to use our stuff. Like the Robonaut up on the space station. You know, it has two hands and it can sw switches and push buttons and use the same tools as humans. So there's a lot of different ways to come at this. I think in the end, it comes down to 
just like many sciences, taking responsibility and looking at things very carefully. You know, it's the measure twice, cut once. Right. Of science. You want to make sure you have rules of what's going on. You try to lay within those rules and just keep an eye on things. But this one specifically was built... To, I, I would just prefer a screen just to go back to your to where you walk in and you you deal with some, somebody at the desk uh, it doesn't need to be a robot it, it could honestly just be an LCD screen with a touch screen and a voice prompt it doesn't need to be a person yeah I've actually been to a fast food restaurant that had a little touch screen and you just push the buttons as to what you wanted like I want my hamburger I want it without pickles with french fries and a chocolate shake and then it you know swiped your card and it spit out a ticket and it went straight back to the the kitchen and they popped out my food. So there's, you know, there's that. So there's yeah, lots of different things that's going on. Oh, are you looking at the uh, yeah, dentist? Yeah, and it, it looks like a real person. It even it even reacts. Oh, I just got yes. creeped out. It even reacts like a person. Oh. Yeah, it has a little gag response. Well, it's, it's specifically built, again, for a specific purpose of training dentists. I know. I can't. You know, it. so it, the more realistic in this case, in that case, and, and I would the prefer they training. learn. I mean, I yeah, agree. You, I, I, as a dentist, you want to learn to yeah. learn yeah. and, you know, yeah. not gag a robot instead of not gag me. It's kind of like how when I get my chicken at a fast food restaurant, I really don't want to know the, the conditions that chicken came from. Just like I don't yeah. want to know that, I don't think, because that is creepy no. to me. Was there was another fast food restaurant sold burgers. It was years ago and they had a, you know, one of them had a campaign where they're like, hey, here's a cow. Look. And everyone got creeped out because they were eating a cow. And they're like, I don't want to connect my burger to the cow. Because yeah. the cow, I can go over and be like, good cow. Yeah. Pat his little head and be like, no, I don't want that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Uh, and of course, they struggle with the Uncanny Valley and CG as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've all seen that. It was funny. The, the Uncanny Valley, the graph that they had had a zombie written on there mm -hmm. or moving realistic things like dip zombie yeah the chat room brought that up too it's yeah uh <clears throat> all right well boy i don't know that just leaves sort of uh, i don't know i i feel a little unsettled yep. by that but it's an interesting robot development and i yeah. at the same time at the same time would really like a robot servant, not a slave. I mean, you know, it can have an off day. That's fine, whatever. Uh -huh. But somebody uh -huh. who could maybe clean up, take out the garbage, do the trash, that kind of stuff. They would kind of need to be my size and my shape. <laughs> and we got here from trying to figure out how little kids learn to talk via a robot. Wow. That was quite the trip. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting enough. Well, that was definitely the, the Wikipedia of conversations. Click, click, click. <laughs> Well, Go down got, the line. Well, we, you know, we've got plenty more to conversate through. So why don't we take a quick pause right here? Because, man, what a heck of a show we have coming up. And uh, now every now and then here on the show, when I get really excited about an Audible book, I make it a pick. And uh, I'm doing it this week. Now, uh, some of you might remember uh, Ready Player One, which was written by Will Wheaton. Or, I'm sorry, read by Will Wheaton on mm -hmm. Audible. And now I'm recommending Red Shirts, which is also read by Will Wheaton. And uh, Will Wheaton, and it is a great. It's basically if you kind of remember Galaxy Quest and how it was kind of a play on Star Trek in some sense. Uh -huh. This is too. You know, red shirts, of course, are the. So think of like think of a parody of Star Trek from the uh, perspective of the away team. I've just started reading it, and it is fantastic. Here's a bit of the prologue. This is totally spoiler from free. the top of the large boulder he sat on. Ensign Tom Davis looked across the expanse of the cave toward Captain Lucius Abernathy, Science Officer King, and Chief Engineer Paul West perched on a second, larger boulder and thought, well, this sucks. Borgovian <laughs> landworms, Captain Abernathy said, and smacked his boulder with an open palm. So this, I should have known. This is a great, this is, this is. Should have known. These are literally the first few moments of the book, and it just it totally draws you in, and it is a it is a funny story right from the beginning. I'm really enjoying it. I've just just got it. It's seven hours and forty one minutes long, so it's a good one to dip into too. If you're not mm. sure if you like audiobooks, it's not a huge commitment, but it's very it's once it gets going, you'll be glad. It's as, it's at least seven hours. One credit too, which means Ooh. if you use the link in the show notes, you could get this book for free. And uh, if you're a new Audible customer, and in fact, you can even cancel your Audible account and you get to keep the book. 
and uh, you support the production of Cybite when you buy these Audible picks. I am loving this book. Check it out. It is Red Shirts, a novel with three codas. It's uh, by John Salazi, I believe is the author, uh, narrated though by Will Wheaton. And he, because he has a geek background and because he also has a Star Trek background, he very inherently gets the humor in the book. And because he gets it, and you know that he gets it, it comes across through his through his reading, and it is it makes me smile all the time. So go check it out. It's yeah. a great read. Red shirts. And link will be in the show notes. All right, Heather. All there right. you go. That's my Audible pick this week. What do you say we move on to the news bite? Let's go. All right. What is our first story in the SciBite news bite? <laughs> <laughs> this week... On the exoplanet front, yeah, the you know echoing in space, yeah, um, yeah. So exoplanets, you know, we've talked about them a whole bunch. How they're discovered. There is a program online that I wanted to point out to people. Okay, and it's so we've talked about it before. How, like I said, you know, exoplanets are discovered. You know, the dip in light. You know, it gets a little dimmer and then brighter again as it passes in front of the star. Yes. Sir. So there are. You know, there's huge amounts of data to process. You know, and computers can go through and catch some of it, but the human brain is the one of the best, far and beyond any computer algorithm, to be able to connect up patterns. So if it's just a little bit off each time, I've heard that. Then the computer can't catch it, but the human eye can go, yep, 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 right there in a row, and go, this is that, this is that. So what a Yale University, Yale University team has goes online and has a program set up. So right now it has like over 150,000 volunteers. Huh. So you so you go through and you it's a part of the Zooniverse. There's these different programs that say you log in and it'll show you pictures. And it'll be like, here's the data. Is there a dip here? And, you know, it'll show you this is an example of this. This is an example of this. So then you can go through and be like, this is nothing, this is nothing. Hey, this looks like a planet, this is nothing. So it goes through and you can go through this data. It is all, you know, open to the public. And they've just had it put in a nice source program. Okay. And so you can, volunteers can go through, in this case, uh, you can, the identification of large exoplanets is much easier to find. The smaller ones, tiny dips. Oh, Okay. So there are a lot of these stars are just kind of scattered. Some of them are variable. So it's big lines, you know, every inch or so. This is really cool. Yeah. And so it'll tell you and you go through and you mark up. Oh my gosh. I really feel like I'm doing some science here. This is great. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> this, this website is like a couple of these. And if you don't necessarily, there's lots of science. There's, you know, if you're not as big into astronomy as I am, then there are, there's a weather one that you can go through and read the lines of data from ship captains. You know, they've said the weather, you know, here they were, here was the weather and you can type it up, you know, and indicate what kind of weather and real, you know, where it was as they're building up this database of weather over the years. At one time they were talk, they were doing even, uh, craters on the moon or rocks on the Mars rovers. Um, what was it? One of the rovers you were supposed to be looking for like clouds or very specific things. So it's, there's all these images or all this data that's visual that you can go through and see. And you can kind of log in so you can build your own reputation. And there are, you know, there have been, oh goodness, there have been some exoplanets that have been discovered by this program. Nothing else. They announced uh, two planets earlier this year. Like just from general users? Just yeah, using just this? from the users. The computer didn't catch them at all. Just the users caught them. You are crapping me. That's awesome. Oh, no. And I mean, I've seen one program where, you know, the first group of people who discover this kind of thing can get something extra and get their names posted on the website. But it'll go back and repeat. So if somebody flags it, it goes back into the system and it stays there. So all of these pictures get handed to, you know, dozens of people. And if all of these people hit the same thing and say, 
this looks like an exoplanet, this looks like an exoplanet. Mm -hmm. Then it goes into kind of a different level. It kind of goes up the system. And once enough people identify as that, then it goes to the general managers. So you have, you know, this team of, you know, general manager scientists. So they, you know, that are so at the top. It's got like a it's got like a tiered system of review. Yeah, so it's going through this you know tiered system, and if you log in, um, I'm not sure if this is a program, but I've seen some of the programs that the more accurate you are, the more kind of higher priority you're given. Essentially, so it's you know if you get ninety percent of everything identified correctly, then you get kind of a little bump up than someone who's only kind of guessing the right thing every once in a while. So they're doing a rep score on the back end, but they're also doing, if you're using an account, it's also sort of like a social aspect where you can friend people and you can follow their discoveries or, you yeah. know, things. I mean, there's there's a really cool kind of like group effort you, uh, yeah. aspect to it. Yeah. And this it's, is super awesome. It's made very, you know, very user friendly, very, you know, visual and click this. It's not really hard to go through and there's not just lines of numbers or text very visual i've seen like i said there's the ship captain weather reports where they've scanned all these logs from ship captains from all sorts of different times going back you know decades and like 100 years or so and so you can go through and the human eye can read that line of text much better than the computer can because you know person has their little scrawl handwriting and you can go through and you click sunny cloudy you know, this is the, the different things, and this is their location. So they can use all this crowdsourced data. And it's very friendly, interactive things where they can go on and they say, you're essentially helping fill scientific data. And I've this seen... So enough, oh, yes. I've I've gotten into some of these programs that I have to watch because it eats your time up like there's no tomorrow. Could they have done something like this pre-internet? I guess sort they could of. have old school had people come in and sit down at some terminals and 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 yeah. look through it. But well, I mean, at that point, it's called um, you know, undergrads, lackeys, whatever you want to call them, whatever students you have, they're on the bottom of the totem pole. Yeah, they get to go through and for asteroid um, discoveries, they're, they're pretty much their only idea is like flipping back and forth between images. There are a diverse different times looking at two glass images or stereoscopic where they have two images side by side. And you kind of look at them eye by eye and be like, oh, there's something that's off. Hand them off. So there's all these type of things where it's it's a smaller crowd of people doing it on the Internet like this. They, you know, they have over 150,000 people. So it says all these people interact with this. In such a way where it kind of tears up and it helps them crunch through the data so much faster. It's oh, really no, this has, not. This has this has reaches far beyond just astronomy. This could be applied yeah. to all kinds of things. Any kind of pattern recognition thing like this. Yeah. Handwriting recognition, pattern recognition, any of these type of programs where they have a lot of data and it just requires somebody to look at it. You know, be you know, this this recognizes to this. Like I said, the astronomy, I keep going back to the, you know, the ship logs. You can read the line off and be like, oh, sunny, cloudy, sunny, sunny, raining, well, horrible storm. What I think is kind of interesting is Crash in the chat room kind of makes a joke. He calls it, you know, this is a cloud or whatever, superhuman computing. And, yeah. you know, when you say it like that, it kind of, it kind of, I don't know, bring me conjures up thoughts of uh, SETI at home or uh, folding at home and things like that. But this is this is different in a way than that because it's it's actually uh, using it's it's not taking advantage of somebody's CPU. No, all it is is, and it is just like going to a website. You go to a website like like a game on a website. You click and do this, and oh, here we go. It's not really eating anything up, rather than your time. All right. Well, and you, it's kind of fun. It's kind of yo. Neat. Yeah, I I'm just I got playing with addicted it. to one. I was like. <laughs> I learned that if I was going to go on there and log on and do it, I had to set a timer. Be like, all right. Yeah. Ding at me in 15 minutes. Otherwise, completely lose track of time. And I'm like, woo. Boy, and you could just claim it as show prep too. So it makes it even harder to make it, you know, not do it. Yeah. 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 Wow. All right. Well, any other thoughts on that one? 
No, it's just one of those things that has been around for a little while, but I wanted to bring it up because it's one. just so nifty and I don't think I have brought it up anything like this and, before. Uh, it's so uh, it's uh, it's available at planterhunters.org, but of course there is a link in the show notes as well. All right, Heather, then I believe it's time for the Two Byte News. Two Byte News. Side Byte. Once a week it's Side Byte and it's Two Byte News on Side Byte. Bye. Nice. That's good. I don't know who those jackals are singing in the background. We've got to get rid of those people. Know. But uh, They're crazy people. Yeah. So what is our uh, first story in the two-byte news section? It's another student design program. I know it makes us all feel like total slackers. Yeah. But I like bringing these student designs up because they're so often built by or designed by people who are undergrads or working towards, you know, their bachelors, their masters. It's just being an optimist about our future. Yeah. It kind of, any if there's any of the younger college students or if you have kids be like hey look you don't don't write yourself off don't write it off because you're not anywhere at the top of a food chain hmm. this specific young man he had a it's a sort of emergency stretcher he had a father who was in firefighting so what he did is he what he was trying to do is create a rapid evacuation stretcher made it out of heat resistant materials sort of rolls up and so you can hang on your back or you can attach it next to an air tank and then once you find somebody you roll it out you can kind of strap them in and it has a little handle so you can help with you know with two people you can help bring them out so it's it was interesting it's not a really big program or really something that's really crazy I love how portable it is when it's all but, rolled up though yeah that's part of it and he really worked with um, local fire department kind of going back and forth and saying here's my idea and they came he made a prototype and then they come back and they're like change this this and this oh, then come for, back for to like, us well if we were going to use this it would need this right that kind of thing yeah so he can kind of go back and forth that's awesome so it's you know he had a, a history with that to kind of have that on his mind with family in the fire fighting industry mm-hmm. you know and he's working with a team but it's interesting that you know, he was designing it and working at it and going back and forth. And hopefully something like this or other students can do these type of things and come up with these crazy ideas because they haven't been told, you know, cookie cutter what to do yet. You know, it's there. It's a... Uh, they can think out of the box. They don't have like yeah. this, well, you can't do it that way because of costs or you can't do it that yeah. way because of, yeah. And so many of these are from like product design things where... You have to make something by the end of the semester or the end of the year, and you're going to be graded by it. So you have to think of really crazy things that not every other student has done for the last 10 years because that professor is going to be bored with it. <laughs> you think of all these crazy things. Right. And sometimes those crazy things like really mean something. This, we talked about a few weeks ago, the, the IV for third world countries, you know, IV dispenser. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So these different kind of things where it's really crazy ideas thought up by students who are kind of coming up in the industry. So I hope these kind of things go forward because some of them are really good. This one is could be really handy. It's a roll up. It's very you know portable. So I wonder how many other things in life that that limitation applies to. So does that mean as you get older, you're more biased towards things and you're not likely to do them, or is it? Do you think it's a personality trait thing? Part. I say partly po- personality. Yeah. I mean, think about your own life. You know, you're doing something, you're like, man, if I could only do it this way, that would be great. Right, okay. okay. You know, I've thought up of a, of a couple ideas. I'm like, this would be really cool if I could make this. You know what? Don't have the time to make such things. Right, Don't right. have the time to go through and build a prototype and then crash it and break it and be like, right. oh, I need to do it this way. Right. Well, so, uh, like uh, Linus Torvalds just recently said, he's like, one of the great things about the Raspberry Pi computer is that it's $25. And that means yeah. you can afford to do something that blows up, like strapped to the back of a rocket. Yeah. Yeah. And some of these, you know, they're student design projects. So they're, a chunk of their time is supposed to be built towards making something. And so some people, you know, obviously some people won't think of these things. Some people will think of really crazy out of the box things that could never work or cost way too much. And sometimes you think of something and it's just sort of a fleeting something 
or something that you wish you could work on, but as far as it gets is, you know, scrawled on the back of a pad of paper. So it all depends on how far you can push it. I mean, mm -hmm. you could trade time for something else. You know, if I really wanted to do something, sure, I could trade some some gaming time or something like that. But it's all a a juggle, really. Indeed, indeed, and they're coming out from a completely different perspective. Oh yeah, yeah. Interesting enough. Well, should we go on to the uh, the next story? I think so. So this one is interesting in the sense that uh, you don't hear a lot about China's space program over here, unless there's like no. a rocket that fails to launch or something like that. Yeah. But that's not the case this week, is it? No. There's, you know, there's all sorts of geopolitical things going on, but a lot of people don't realize they actually sent a person to space in 2003. Mm, okay. So what's new is that June 16th, they launched, uh, is the fourth manned mission uh, launched from the Gobi Desert, and it had you know, three taikonauts, as they call them. Um, one who's been to space twice, and the China's first female went up. She had been a fighter pilot. Right, so what was special is they, they docked two spacecraft together on Monday, June 19th, 18th. So they had a little capsule up orbiting the Earth. And so they had this, and they... Ca ca uh, Capture them together. Hmm. So it's kind of this. They're thinking about making their own space station. Whoa, really? Just so they're so they're practicing is what it is. They're up there. Yeah, kind this of. kind of thing. They they want to practice. They want to build these things on another. One thing I did read in the story is they made the the connections very more universal. So they said, you know, if we're ever invited over to the uh, you know the this international space station, then we could hook right up. You know, and and have have ourselves a party. Now they say they want the space station in 2020. Jeez. So they're in they're space development with, time. That's like that's like in a couple of years. Yeah, they're they're pushing forward pretty fast. Yeah. But there were, I mean, they are. You know, there's not many countries that have put up their own people by their own right power. Right. America, Russia, that's a the two big things that have been putting astronauts or cosmonauts, whatever you want to call them, into space. Right. You know, other countries are able to to help these programs and send them up on the shuttle or you know, things like that. But this is, you know, China sending their own up, so it makes them kind of in a They're in a new in exclusive a very, club. Yeah, they're in an exclusive club of these kind of people. And uh, also, I wonder, I wonder how many. Maybe I'm just, I'm, I totally don't know, but I wonder how many of those other countries have also had women up there. If they've all been men. Uh, there's been quite a few who had mixed. Okay. But this was definitely a a part that they were announcing. They've kind of been going back and forth for a little while whether there was going to be a woman or not. Oh, really? They didn't really say until almost the last minute. Jeez, it seems like you'd kind of want to know. Maybe they just weren't saying publicly. Yeah, it was, they had it down to two. So they're like, we could choose one of these these gals. But they just wouldn't announce until the last minute. It was essentially, they said, it's going to be a decision that has to be made right before launch. Hmm. But they, they were all training for a couple, I think a couple years now. So there's there's a lot of different things that were going on. Some of it we may never know. But kick our butt in gear maybe a little more. Right. That's part of it too. I mean, yeah. the, the space race back in the day was, you know, America versus Russia. Right. Right. As we we were competing against each other, so I could be down for a little competition. Yeah, competition uh, is a never bad thing. Yeah. See what we got. Now, uh, one of the things that's pretty hotly debated these days is sugar. But yes. you have a story here that might warm people up to the sweet stuff, don't you? Yes. Best story ever. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not space. So some MIT engineers have developed a fuel cell that runs on glucose. This is pretty incredible. Yes. The same sugar that powers human cells. They have a little silicon wafer that it's uh, 64 millimeters in, in around. And so it can get powered by the glucose. So... This can dry like brain implants. So it's like, sorry, sweetie, I, I don't want to have to eat this Snickers, but I need to charge 
my phone. Oh my gosh, that was the first thing I thought of. I was like, well, not phone, <laughs> but I was like, oh, I have this little medical device that's going to help my brain do this, or that's oh, going to help. Oh, be awesome for things like pacemakers or yes, uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So there's there's pacemakers or sure, sure. you know there are some people who have to have implants of the brain uh, to help with seizures something like that where there's little electrodes that go in and can keep firing essentially pacemakers for the brain to help keep it on well, track about, and not going crazy think about you know down the road luke skywalker type limb replacements where there's something that's yes. a little more powered you know stuff they're they're working on right now yeah so it's now right now most of it it's Essentially, it passes through um, spinal fluid or something like that where the amount of sugar it, it takes up, the body is not using it. It's it's going to be fine. But the I still think that thing, I was like, you know what? My my heart's kind of feeling a little bit, I, I got to have chocolate. I'm, exactly, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I got to have ice cream. The unfortunate- This is not my fault. The unfortunate truth is- the American diet has way too much sugar in it, just on its own. We have plenty. We have plenty in there. It's okay. But you know what? It's, it's kind of like hard to be using it up. It is you could kind of just you, what you need. You kind of look at it like like how maybe a little bit like how Popeye looks at spinach, just a little bit. I, mean, yeah. I, could, I think that would be fair if you're if you're if it's if it's powering your heart. Yeah. Should we uh, talk well, about this next story? Uh, just real qu- uh, quick. We've talked mm-hmm. about these medical devices in the past. All these. You know, recently about helping people walk and yeah. all this kind of stuff. And yeah. this is getting those power sources that we've been talking about. Oh my gosh, then you have to take this power source or how small can you get them? This is getting them smaller and smaller and off of a power source that you don't really have to recharge. That's why you eat your Snickers bar. Right. I No, I do like that. And you could also, I would think, use that in other areas too. It wouldn't have to be just inside the body. It could be all kinds of things. Because yeah. glucose is something that... I mean, we have a lot of. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's awesome. Uh, now, do you know, like, when, when this kind of thing is announced, is this one of those things where it's not anything we'd even see on market for 20 years? Oh, yeah, probably. Bummer. Yeah, this is, they've coming up with an idea. And so many of these type of things, they're like, idea, it works. Now, they're going through the design process. In two years, it may go nowhere. Or it may go enough, then, especially things with the, the body. You have to go through a huge process of making sure it's going to be I, it's going to be okay with the body. It's not going to mess with anything. It's a whole process of getting it closer and closer to a couple people trying it out. And then once it get clears, try a bigger population of people. So it'll be a while before we have uh, Snickers powered hearts. Maybe but. in five, ten years on side we'll have videos of rats walking with these things in them like we just had last week with the... Uh with the last week's uh, video that we was really yeah, there'll be a little sugar clu- sugar cube yeah like right. munch 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 run <laughs> all right now uh, why don't we move on to this next story because this one uh, I've been wanting to talk about for a couple of weeks and we also got an email this week did you see that did- I didn't actually oh okay so I thought maybe that's why you included this story we got an email today from oh. Peter from Peter who asked if we knew about the story and asked if you were going to talk about it so uh, in a sense this is also uh, I should uh, I should play a little uh, Incoming from for Peter too because this is also uh, a, a feedback. Your feedback, yeah. Yeah. All right. So here we go. So thank you, Peter, for uh, sending in your uh, your feedback. All right, Heather. Tell me here about this next story. Coming at us from all directions. Some space telescope donations. There's a pair of, pair of telescopes that were donated to NASA from the National Reconnaissance Office. So these were essentially spy satellites that didn't get to orbit. So they've got them stored in New York, uh, Rochester, New York. So they're kind of sitting there. They're all built. They're completely ready to go. All you have to do is get them into space. And they realized they weren't going to be able to use these, so they kind of gave them to NASA. And they're higher resolution than the Hubble. Yeah, they're on that on that scale. So they're, you know, eight feet wide. They're comparable to Hubble Space Telescope. Oh, so I, one of the okay. things that I've been but I've personally been worried about is they're talking about the the new telescope is the James Webb telescope or all these new telescopes which are going to be infrared or a lot of the data is going to come back and just be mostly interesting to people in the astronomical field. Right. You know, one of the great things about Hubble is it has 
beautiful, beautiful pictures that you can show everybody. Yeah. And they go, ooh, pretty, how yeah, good. It, and it generates public interest. It generates a lot of public interest, mm-hmm, a lot totally. of public identif- identification. So these are more telescopes that could be used similarly. That you, I mean, they can still be used for so much scientific work, but it can give us more of those visual images. Now, current budgetary systems say NASA can't really do anything with them except store them. They spend about, seventy thousand a year storing them too. Yeah, not not to, nothing to sneeze at, but at the cost of what it would be to build these kind of things from scratch. Yeah. You know, hire all the people, make all the the equipment, the getting everything together, then it's it's not so bad. Now, you know, we can't really cost afford to put them up right now. Right. But That's- hopefully as soon as we can really all it takes is getting together the right rocket that can take this payload up and successfully put it into orbit. Right. But I, though one of the stories I read when NASA people were like, it was kind of funny is, you know, get a call up and they can't really tell us what's going on. You know, we really don't know because they really can't come out and say until they have the clearance to say, hey, uh, we got some spy satellites. You want them? Can't really come out and say that right away. They have to wait until there's cl- they get the, the clearance in order to tell NASA, this is what we have. So, you know, until uh, then, it's, it's, you know, it's we it's, have some instruments that you might be interested in um keep us on your phone list <laughs> until a little while where they can actually talk about what's there so this uh is we're so we're talking about two telescopes yes. that have mirrors that measure eight feet wide mm-hmm. uh which make them comparable to the hubble yep then we just have sitting in in a warehouse at the cost yep. of 70k a year yeah and meanwhile nasa yep can barely get the, the web telescope. Yeah, it's way over budget, way behind schedule. And we just saw a story last week. Yeah. That the Air Force just landed their oh, own yes. sh- shadow space shuttle that was yes. developed alongside NASA's shuttle that just spent like 150 days up in space or something like that, or even longer than that. Yeah, it was a record setting. And it's all unmanned. What the heck kind of shadow space program do we have going on that we don't get to know anything about? And wh- well, why do we have spy satellites that have the same resolution as the Hubble telescope, which is looking at other galaxies? I mean, what the heck could they look not at? not going to question such things. That's just very strange so, to me. All of this, so and I they're just sitting around, and they didn't don't use them? On our doors. <laughs> wow. I mean, these, these. I think, just, 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 just the acknowledgement that these exist, I think, raises a lot of questions. A lot of budget oh, yeah. questions. Could you imagine the money spent to build these? The money just spent on these? That's just for nothing. And who knows what else? There could be other ones that are up there that they did use. Well, yeah, you're going to have that kind of a stuff. But any of this technology that we finally find out again, uh, out about, I mean, the, you know, the shuttle. Ugh. You're going to have people that can take that picture. There are so many things in orbit that essentially amateur astronomers can track they can mm. there's been a number of people who are you know photography uh ccd astrophotography it just bums me out because if they would have said well instead of like, instead huh. of b- building these let's 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 allocate that money to nasa's budget that's all i just would have preferred that well you know that's whatever the money gets shuffled to of course i would love more money to go to nasa well at least in the, the end they're getting I something yeah the one thing i can say is some of that technology is sort of hand in hand. You know, some of it was set up by NASA. So they're able to take it in different directions because a lot of the a lot of the science and the you know, that backup is made by NASA. So you're gonna have some essentially cross contamination of science. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, well uh, why don't we uh get things back on track and talk about our okay. next story. Yes. Pitcher plants. We some people may not know uh, most people know about them. They're they have you know, kind of like it says, there's a little pitcher with a little leaf over it, and the plant is actually eating insects. You know, munches on flies and yeah. such like that. Yeah. Now, what they recently what they were looking at They're is They're also in Mario. Yes, they are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you know, jump on them and or right. throw a turtle shell at them, and you're right. okay. Right. So what they're looking at is there's a certain type of pitcher plant where the covering, the leaf, is built so that it's 
it's made so that when you know the insects in the rain hide underneath it to get out of the rain and so when a raindrop hits it like a like a diving board whacks the it hits the insect down into the mouth the essentially yeah it hits it down into the mouth and in fact the they're made so that the lid of the surface is covered with specialized wax crystals so it makes them hard to, it makes it hard for the little insects to grab onto it okay so you know flies and crazy little bugs they have it so it has kind of like a non-stick surface yeah it has a non-stick surface spray to the top that's great so they go and try to hide underneath there you know ants or everybody tries to hide underneath to get out of the rain and then the raindrop hits and they're just whacked right into uh to get munched my first thought is man this plant is really dependent on rainfall <laughs> I mean, from a lot of different angles, but it's a pretty clever design. Yeah, well, I mean, they have these, they work on their own. Some of them will secrete a very sweet smell that draws them in. Oh, yeah, sure. They go, they want to go check it out, and then, you know, they can't get out of the, you know, the angle until they're down at the bottom, and then they, you know, get eaten in the stomach Ooh. plant goo. Now, have you ever had because you know you can you can get them for the house. Yeah. Have you ever had one? No. No. Oh, well, there you go. I've seen them, but it's always kind of interesting. I remember talking to someone. They're like, "Yeah, you know this kind of thing. You know, eating the flies in the office." Mm-hmm, they're like, sure. Wait, what? It kind of seems like it'd be handy bugs? for that. Kind of, you know. Well, well, like I don't want to have a pet spider, so no. this seems like a pretty good alternative. But yeah, I can feed my would be tiny pet spider to the pitcher plant. Sure, sure. Like, here you go, pitcher plant. <laughs> or feed, some, feed it some ants. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, any other thoughts on that one? No, it's just kind of another interesting way that pitcher plants munch on the insects. And I kind of want to get one, to tell you the I truth. Know. I wouldn't mind getting one. All right, well, then I so believe... If you, uh, if you get one, you'll have to water it just right so it rains on it. Oh, really? Oh, 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 I thought, oh, I thought it rains on it to help right. help it eat. Are you implying <laughs> I ha- are you implying I have flies, Heather? No, I think, I think you're implying I have flies. I, I don't know what's going on. If you have a pitcher plant, what are you going to feed it? Oh, it requires it requires bugs. Little children fingers? Does that does that work? <laughs> no, I don't suggest little children fingers. Oh, maybe we should move on to the spacecraft update. Yes. <laughs> All right. What is our spacecraft update this week? Voyager 1. Yeah. Closer and closer to interstellar space. A couple months ago, we talked about you know, how it was getting closer, how it was starting to... the Essentially, the solar winds were starting to drop off. Mm-hmm. I remember that. So now it's, you know, it's sending back data. The data itself takes 16 and a half hours to get back to us. And you figure that's traveling at the speed of light, right? Radio waves, they travel at the speed yep. of light. They travel at the speed of light. Yeah. They do because that is light. Yes, so what I they're know. seeing now is that cosmic energetic particles. So it's sort of the the stuff in between out there where it's stars that went supernova, all this kind of things. There's been an increase of it since between January 2009 and January 2012. It's sort of gradually increasing um, about 25%. So about, you know, 0.7% a month kind of increasing. Now, starting on May 7th of this year, it started increasing at 5% a week. It jumped from 0.7% a month hmm. to 9% a month, oh. about a hundred fold increase. Oh, okay. So it's recently what? just going crazy in intensity. So this is where they're getting from that, the implication that, okay, it must be really getting to the edge of what our sun's influence has on space. Yes. So they ex- what they're looking at now is they expect this, you know, essentially high density that they're going to go through, like uh, essentially a bow wave. Like you, you know, a boat traveling through, you have that little wave of water in front of it where it's pushing the water. So you have a little bow in front of you. But if their data is showing a drop off, what suggests that, what suggests there's a big wave approaching? Well, they were, what the drop off was, but there are winds from the sun. And then there is interstellar stuff. So they saw the winds from the sun start dropping. Yeah, so it's getting, it was getting really low. 
So they're like, okay, we're getting outside the bubble of what the sun does. And so now what's happened is they're seeing the interstellar stuff. All those readings start going off the chart. So, you know, leaving the sun behind, getting right on top of it. You know, they're reading this interstellar stuff and it's just getting stronger and stronger. Essentially, at this point, all they're waiting for is the magnetic lines to change. So I looked it up before the show. Uh-huh. Do you do you uh, do you recall when they uh, sort of project early when they think they'll stop hearing from Voyager one when they think it'll completely run out of power? Twenty uh, twenties. Yeah, twenties. Twenty twenty five is what I saw. Yeah, that's, so that's not bad. Right up, in, right up until then, we're getting closer and closer, and again, they're expecting anywhere between you know a couple months and a couple years before we actually read interstellar readings. The uh, the more I hear about this, the more grateful I am that they made the investment to to launch these back then. Because now our yeah. generation, uh, like th- th- some of the people that launch this, aren't around anymore. You know, because they were in their fifties and sixties working for NASA, and the, you know yeah. they they're gone now. But our generation now gets to watch. This is what they. This is they're getting to the point now where the, what this what they were built for was what they're doing right now. I mean, this is always the hope, right? They go out this far oh, yeah. and we get to see out this far. And now we're actually getting to see it. I mean, we're really fortunate. Oh, yeah. We're we're right on the edge of being able to, to do this. And whatever data we get back is starting, it was going to be the first data of, of its kind for all of humanity. This is the first time our species will have ever done this. Yeah. And this is the thing that, oh, this goes back to the budget stuff, Heather. This is why, you know, this is why it's so amazing that we did this stuff. Because yeah. it's big. Yeah. Pretty cool. And yep. uh, we'll keep hearing more stuff, I'm sure, as we go, right? I hope so. Yeah. We should be getting signals for it uh, until the 20, 2020s. So. Yep. Now I mean. we're waiting for the magnetic, like I said, the magnetic lines will orient, uh, the orientation will switch about 90 degrees. But that data in itself takes about a couple of weeks for them to go through. So once we see that data come out, be like, hey, that happened a couple of weeks ago. We're in interstellar space. <laughs> and like the chat room points out, we're now right on track for V'ger. So uh, everything is going as Star Trek, the motion picture predicted. So that's yes. good. All right, uh, Heather, always good. What do you say uh, we step on into the uh, time machine and go All back? Right. All right. Here we step in. Close the door. Okay. Here okay. we go. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. I bumped Careful. it. Sorry about that. Sorry Don't about bad. that. Don't do that. Man, Ugh. it's a good thing we weren't going like 400 years this time, because I don't know. After I she, know. So this uh, this week, we're going 119 years ago, June 21st, 1893. What happened this week in science? The Ferris wheel premiered at the Chicago Columbian Exposition. Wow. So it was the America's Third World World's Fair. Actually invented by a guy called George Washington Ferris. So it was named after him. Okay. It was... It was kind of attraction like similar to the Eiffel Tower. Created 36 cars to carry 60 passengers. The whole passenger part of it weighed 150 tons. Ho, ho, ho. What? Jeez. Yeah. And it didn't have the rigid spokes like we have, like most often visual today. It had like a web of cables, like a bicycle wheel. I would think so. Yeah. So it had two 140 foot steel towers. 45 foot axle it was the largest piece of forged steel in the world at that time it looks kind of elegant too i'm i found a book about it on amazon that i'm looking at Ooh. and uh it it looks classy yeah yeah i mean the book looks classy too but they the picture they have it on the cover looks real classy that's pretty cool yeah Some, sometimes these things are kind of vaguely science this is well the oh. the build of it was very sciencey wasn't it especially oh, for the yeah. first time all right. Well, our next destination doesn't take us too lo- too far back. 34 years ago, June 22nd, 1978. Sharon, Pluto's big moon. Oh. Well, it kind of shares the same planisphere. They the Sharon doesn't actually orbit it per se. They kind of orbit around a, a center point. But they discovered that Pluto was not by itself in 1978. What happened was a astronomer using the Naval Observatory in Arizona took a picture of Pluto and it showed it to be kind of not a circle, like mm. elongated, more like an egg. Hmm. 
So you're like, huh, that's funny. And then it started changing positions over time. So they thought, okay, maybe it's maybe it's our instruments, you know, giving <laughs> funny things. Okay. So, you know, you got to blame the instrument. Something funny happens, blame the instrumentation. Sure, sure. So they checked that. They checked background stars. Everything was okay. So they went through all the data and they kept looking at it and everything corresponded to there being something else there to make it kind of a long graded circle. So they went through and they said, hey, this this has got to be a moon. You know, about, they said it was 16, 19 That's and That's no half, moon, a, Heather. That's a, oh, sorry. It is a moon. <laughs> That's no instrument horrible lying to us. That's a moon. Uh, okay, that was terrible. Uh, but so it has they discovered, you know, it had a six and a half day orbit. It was nineteen and a half kilometers away. So they were able to get all this data from the you know, the orbit of how where the elongation was going. And it was at, uh, the name Sharon was named after the boatman in Greek mythology who took the souls across the dead uh across uh off across the river Styx. And Pluto was not actually named after our friendly neighborhood dog for, you know, a specific mouse. But uh, Pluto was like a god of the underworld. Right. So Pluto was out there on the very edge and cold. So he was the underworld. And then his moon was the was the boatman to take people over there. That's a so pretty, there you go. That's interesting. That's an interesting little mythology bit there. Yeah. All right. Well, that's the past, Heather. But heck, why don't we look up into the sky this week? Yes. Wednesday, June 20th, we've got the summer solstice for the Northern Hemisphere. It's going to be the longest day and the shortest night. The sun is going to reach its most northern point in the sky. Uh, the Southern Hemisphere uh, winter begins now as well. So it's going to have the shortest day and the longest night. So we're coming up on that. Thursday, June 21st, Mercury is going to be l pretty low in the east-northeast horizon just as twilight starts. You can look, uh, there's a bright star to the upper right of the crescent moon, but it'll be kind of hard. That's a star, but it'll kind of be a little hard to spot. It's pretty close to the horizon, mm. and Mercury's not that easy to spot anyway. Mm. Now, Friday, June 22nd is a little bit, uh, Friday and Saturday are busy days. On Friday, Venus is going to be visible in, visible in the low in the eastern sky at early dawn. Jupiter's going to be to its upper right. So in dawn, you've got Jupiter and Venus. Jupiter is going to be the the higher because Jupiter is a little more awesome. You know, <laughs> speaking speaking totally unbiased. No bias here. Network. No. Jupiter biased. Yeah, you know. And at twilight, you'll be the crescent moon. You'll have Mercury to the west of that. So you've got Venus and Jupiter in the morning on Friday, and Mercury and the moon at night. Nice. Now as we move on to Saturday, Mercury is still going to be well, kind of visible in the western horizon. It'll be to the left of a pair of bright stars, uh, Castor and Pollux. Hmm. So there's a pair of bright stars, and then there's Mercury just to uh, just to the right of them. On Saturday, also, the moon will be by a bright star, Regulus. About a fist width to the east-southeast will be that star. Now, if you go about two hand spans, so your hand stretched out to the southeast, you'll find Mars. There you go. Mars. Two, two more hand spans, and you get to Spica and Saturn. Spica is the brightest star, and Sa so Saturn. So you got kind of in a line. You've got the moon, then Regulus, a star, then keep going, and you get Mars, and another couple of hand spans, and you get Spica and Saturn. Wow, that is a really, like you said, a very busy sky. Yes. And, you know, as always, you can check the show notes because there was a lot of fist wits and hand wits there and a lot of evenings and mornings to kind of keep track of. There's also a nice little little picture that I include in there very often so you can kind of visualize it, read about it. Right. You can you can just go take a you can just go take a look at it and say, oh, okay, yep, oh, that, yep, that's what I saw. That is, and that's then you can show people like, Hey, family, look at that. Mm -hmm. And they will, or friends, and they'll be like, you're cool. There you go. That's the best way to spread the word about the show is word to worth market, word to, word to mouth, 
mouth to face hole. I'm not sure how that goes. I don't know. I'm not sure. Something about receiving words from people about things. Yeah. Well, Heather, I think that's the whole show. I think so. Well, great show. Thank you very much for another fantastic episode. 51 of them now. Yes. Wow. And thank you, everyone. My for goodness. I know. Seriously, that's an accomplishment. Congratulations. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this week's episode of SciBite. We'll be right back here next week. Remember, we're live Tuesday evening, 7.30 p.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv. And then available for download just a little bit after that. See you next week.